In general, history has downplayed the role that women have played in military conflicts through the ages. Until very recently, war was generally considered the preserve of men, but increasingly, we know that's not the case. That traditional view was based on an extremely narrow understanding of war, purely as battlefield engagements, which do tend to be male-dominated. However, women play less visible but crucial roles in everything from military logistics to surveillance and planning. I think it's probably fair to say that that's even more the case in guerrilla conflicts like the Irish Revolution or the French Resistance to the Nazis. Indeed, in the Irish experience, the key role women played remained largely forgotten throughout the 20th century until recent research has led to a greater understanding and acknowledgement of their involvement. When it comes to the story of the French resistance, the general picture was similar. If 20th century histories were to be believed, the resistance was male-dominated and French women, at most, played a very minor role fighting the Nazi occupation of their country. Most movies and dramas tend to reinforce this. Even the ones that do include prominent women often portray them as unusual or atypical. Now, this episode of the podcast the second of two, on the story of Irish involvement in the French resistance, reveals a very different history. My guest, Dr David Murphy, has made remarkable discoveries about Irish women's involvement in the French resistance. In last week's episode, David talked about the scores of forgotten Irish people whose service to the French resistance remains largely unknown in Ireland to the present day. But in this episode, we continue the story focusing in on Irish women because David's research revealed that Irish men and women served in equal numbers, which surprised many at the time. So in this episode, we will look at why Irish women joined the resistance in comparatively large numbers and what exactly they did. Before we move into this fascinating story, let's get the introductions out of the way. My name is Finn Dwyer. This is the Irish History Podcast. And as I mentioned, my guest today is Dr. David Murphy. David works in the Centre for Military History and Strategic Studies in the Department of History in Maynooth University. Just to flag, there won't be an episode out next week. I'll be editing that series on the history of podcasting that I mentioned last week. Now, I'm still looking for your input here. I have a short survey linked in the show notes below where you can have a chance to give your input into that series on the history of Irish podcasting. You can submit answers up until July the 7th, so don't forget to have your say. As I mentioned, the link is in the show notes below. If you do want more history content next week and you don't want to wait for that series on the history of podcasting to come out, the two final installments of my exclusive series on the Irish Civil War is out now. Now that series is based around several interviews with Dr Brian Hanley from the History Department of Trinity College Dublin. Brian is a leading expert on Irish republicanism and the broader revolutionary era and the full series available for supporters is around two and a half hours long. In our conversation, Brian picked apart the complexities of the conflict and I think it's fair to say he'll challenge a lot of stereotypes that we all have about the Civil War. Now, as I mentioned, that series is exclusively available for show supporters. You can get it today at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Finally, one more important announcement. If you, like me, listen to your podcasts on the Stitcher app, you may not be aware, but it's being shut down on August the 29th. And after that, you'll not be able to listen to the podcast there. So make sure you subscribe to the Irish History Podcast in whatever new podcast app you move to. Sound on today's episode is by Kate Dunley. To begin this episode, David began by introducing his findings on the Irish women who served in the French resistance. These, when they were released, surprised many. As I mentioned, Irish men and women served in roughly equal numbers, which stands in sharp contrast to traditional views of the French resistance, which considered it dominated by men. However, rather than look for exceptionalism in the Irish women who served, David questioned the way French records had been compiled and whether they had distorted the overall involvement of women. In the 1960s, people applied to have the resistance status recognised and it had pension ramifications, etc. And about 40% of those people did not get resistance status. And it seems to be in a lot of women in those. 
And the attitude seems to have been, this is all, this is the patriarchy at work here now. But I mean, the people recording it are men, the women come forward and the men's reaction is, oh, you know, now you weren't really in the resistance where you, you were kind of like helping your brother. He was in the resistance or you made the tea or something like that. So they don't get, they don't get recorded. I think the Irish women get recorded consistently because they are foreign, because they're non-Irish and you can't fob off a non-French citizen quite as quick. And then also in post-war France, France is trying to rebuild its relationships after the, the, the Vichy thing and some of the stuff they got into themselves. They're trying to build their relationships again with Britain, with Ireland, with America. So I think that is why it's the, it's the, it's the non-French aspect gets them into the record quicker than a French woman. From this, we moved on to talk about individual cases of Irish women involved in the French resistance. It was when I heard about these cases that I decided they needed a separate show of their own. The lives these women led were absolutely remarkable. Yeah, I mean, Catherine McCarthy, I mentioned her already. She was, she was from, she's from Drimmel League in Cork. She was an Irish Franciscan nun, and she was a nursing sister. So she's based in around a hospital in Connacht, northern France, in around Bethune. That's where she's stationed. And in the aftermath of Connacht 1940 and on Cork, she finds, she ends up with a lot of British and a lot of, a lot of French soldiers in the wards. So she starts getting them out. When they get healthy, she gets them out. She gets involved with a, kind of a movement known as Musée de l'Homme. Musée de l'Homme is the big, it's still their big anthropological museum in the centre of Paris. It's in the Trocadero. I'm sure some people who are listening have been to it. It's, a, it's actually a very nice cocktail bar on the, on the balcony. So if you may have been in the bar, it's that big Trocadero building that looks down towards the Eiffel Tower. So that's where it's based. They're basically hiding in plain sight. They run it from there. Her job is to get people from northern France to Paris. Then they're picked up in, in kind of like in Paris and they will move then down towards the Spanish frontier. OK, and then you hop them across the Pyrenees into Spain, neutral Spain, and you can get them back that way. So that's her job. That's what she's doing. Catherine was eventually captured and neither her status as a nun nor her nationality protected her. Quite a risky kind of a risky kind of line of work to be in. And then, perhaps not surprisingly, 1941, she essentially is betrayed, she gets arrested. She's initially sentenced to death. He also will later on sentence her to be one of the, the, the disparus to just not only be executed, but to just disappear. OK, and this is this was a method of, you know, kind of like the, the SS got into later on in the war. But she's bounced from camp to camp. And um, amazingly, when Ravensbrook, Ravensbrook is the women's concentration camp. When Ravensbrook is liberated, she's still alive. And apparently, like, you know, she, she was kind of like totally emaciated whenever else. But she is basically taken out, rehabilitated, and goes, as so many of these people do, just goes back to her normal life, lives up until the 1960s. Given she remains unknown in wider society, I asked David, was her wartime service acknowledged overseas? Uh, no, she, well, she, gets, she, gets a, she gets a French medal. I think she gets uh, acknowledged by the American government. She has family still existing in Cork who I, one of the family was talking about, kind of like trying to write a book about her. The fact she returned to normal life is something that always amazes me about people like this. How does a person do that? You'd have to think the rest of their lives must have been lived in the shadow of their experiences of the war. Now, we went on to talk about the most remarkable of all the Irish women who served. As you're about to hear, it would be difficult for a fiction writer to come up with a character like Patricia O'Sullivan without it seeming completely unbelievable. Yeah, Paddy, she's interesting. She's the daughter of a kind of like a Dublin. Sometimes he refers to himself as an engineer. Sometimes he's referred to as a plumber. Her Belgian mother, Irish father, she is in London when the war breaks out. She gets involved with, she goes to the women's RAF, the WAF. She gets involved in that. And that's all rather a bit tame for her. So she eventually will kind of volunteer for service for what is known as the SOE, okay, Special Operations Executive, which is, I'm sure people are aware of it. There's been so many movies made about him, like Kate Blanchett film, Charlotte Grey. That's, you know, I don't know if any SOE agent look quite as glamorous, but you're basically, initially when you're asked, when you were asked to join this, you're not told why. Okay, it's that, it's that secret. O'Sullivan has been trained as a wireless operator. She's then trained in weapons training, demolitions, that kind of stuff. And she's parachuting into France in 1944. She actually volunteers to go in the run-up to the Normandy landings. Her job is to go, obviously, to do the wireless operation stuff and send back messages. But she also has to engage in training other people to do wireless operations as well. It's, it's quite interesting in that when you look at our file still exists, 
and she gets some really bad discipline reports, you know, that she's kind of like, she's got attitude. At one stage, she just she just basically leaves camp, buggers off, goes up to London to go to a party. Uh, another stage, she talks to a journalist and she's not named. The, the authority is saying she could be identified to her. You get the sense that she's very bored, that she wants to go. She wants to go trance, wants to go. And she volunteers in March 44 before her training is completed. And they are so desperate to get people to go. She does it. She goes and she parachutes into France and does an astoundingly good job. She runs through that operation all the way up until the, the late summer of 44. There's a great photograph of her leaning against a car somewhere in it's kind of like southern France when it's been liberated herself and two other guys. And they're just, you know, the, it's just it's just a very cool photograph. Lives up to the 1990s. When she dies, her family are going through. Her family never knew anything about this. She kept the emerita. She told them nothing. And when they were going through our stuff, they realized, my God, Mammy was in the SOE and and then it started working backwards from there. But an amazing woman. I mean, at some stage she's going around. She does she does so many things that she's not supposed to do. Like she travels around with a bike with her radio set on it. And that's a big no-no. And at some stage, she stopped at a, a Nazi checkpoint, at a German checkpoint. Basically, what she does is she chats the guy up, gets gets it, gets a date room. She's going to meet him later on that day in the cafe or whatever. And that's what gets her through. And he doesn't look in the bag. Like she's got she's got the bag perched on the bike with a radio set. And maybe if it had been discovered, that is brutal interrogation and then execution. That's what's going to happen. But she chats him up. He's quite happy with that. And she just continues on her merry way. But these, this is the style of people. They just did this kind of amazing stuff. And it makes it terribly difficult for somebody like me trying to trace them down. But then they don't talk about it. And there's, there's, there's minimum archival trace as well. So it's, it's a tough one. In this episode and the last one, we touched on the risks of being involved in the French resistance, but I wanted to explore this in greater detail. Given the ferocity of the Nazi occupation of France, this underscores the bravery of those involved. David now explains what happened to them if they were caught. If you're caught for this, it, it's all bad, and there's various routes that it's going to go down. You know, the quickest route is actually you're caught. They're going to they're gonna interrogate you because they're going to want to get as much information as you possibly can about your group out of you before those people disappear. So you will be subjected to very brutal, very quick interrogation. Then it may be sentenced to immediate execution. OK, and that's it. It's over. I don't know if there's a fate worse than death, but then if you're if you're not executed straight away, then it's concentration camps. OK, and you're sent to concentration camp. And will you die of the conditions or will you be executed there or what's going to happen? I mean, we have this one guy, Robert Armstrong from Edgewardstown, Edgewardstown in County Longford, Mostrum in County Longford. He is involved in quite, he gets away for quite a long time. He's involved between 1940 and 1943. And he's, but he is eventually kind of like snaffled up and he's set to Valentine and he is supposedly executed in December of 1944. Okay, so that's that's kind of like, I, from what I can gather, that was a firing squad. When Reagan's book is liberated, they're actually, Catherine L. McCarthy is in, is in it as a prisoner. There's another Irish nun, Agnes Flanagan, is in it as a prisoner. Uh, there's a woman called Catherine Crean, who it actually dies within a couple of weeks of the, of the concentration camp being liberated. She actually dies. So there's three or four actually Irish women in Reagan's book when it's actually kind of like liberated. At the end of the war, one of whom doesn't doesn't get through it. And we've got there's other people as well. I mean, there's there's a guy called Robert Vernon, also Dublin. He's involved, he's arrested in 1943. He's executed in January of 1945 at Sonnenberg, another concentration camp. And when you think about it, that's quite late in the war to be executed. And I'm sure a lot of people are aware of this when you look at that last kind of like you know, February, January, February, March in Nazi Germany, and that basically if Germany is going down. Any significant prisoners in the concentration camps would be executed and they would try and kill huge numbers of Jews as well in that kind of like last gasp of the regime. So he's executed in that, in that kind of like buried. In the course of our conversations, we talked about people who returned to normal life after the war, rarely speaking about their experiences. However, David brought up the tragic case of an Irishman, Patrick Sweeney, who after falling on hard times brought up his wartime experiences. The reaction in the late 40s was not what we might expect. And there's another interesting guy. There's a guy called Patrick Sweeney from Mayo, and he sent a Buchenwald. He sent a Buchenwald, and he drops off the radar. He drops off the radar then. And I thought he'd been executed. I mean, I reckon he'd been executed. 
I came across a reference to a Patrick Sweeney going on trial in Edinburgh in Scotland, maybe about 46, about 47, 46, 47. He'd been collecting money as a veteran under false pretenses. This was the charge. And at the trial, his defence lawyer said, look, this man is, is broken. He was in Buchenwald. And, and, the, and the judge gives him no allowance whatsoever. The judge obviously doesn't know, doesn't know or he doesn't care what went on in concentration camps. And he gives him a couple of years hard labour for this. Patrick Sweeney from County Mayo. And I just find this amazing. Like The, the, the lawyer says, look, my, 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 my client was subject to, to daily beatings and so on and so forth. Uh, Brady got out of at Buchenwald with his life. And it cuts no thing with the judge. And he's obviously, when you kind of look at it, he's the, the, the story of the case, he's a broken man kind of thing. But no no lenience from the, from the judge, from the beak, you know. That's the, the kind of like trajectory. Like it's it's dangerous work. You know, you're either caught yourself or maybe somewhere in the group is caught and they rat you out. Or in some cases, German intelligence, and there was various German intelligence agencies doing this, get somebody inside the group who then blows the, the whole group and you're caught. And if you're caught, it is torture, it is maybe immediate execution, or best case scenario, best case scenario is a concentration camp. That's that's your trajectory. As we moved towards the end of our conversation, I asked David about the motivations of the Irish people who served in the French resistance. They were a pretty diverse group, as we've heard over the last two episodes. They included soldiers all the way through to members of religious orders. So I asked David what drove them and if the history of resisting occupation in Ireland played a factor. I think all those things hold true. I think you're, you're, when you're looking at the religious, there's that motivation to help people. And it, it's this, I had a student years ago who did a PhD with me on evasion lines. And she came across it. So she was looking at the testimony of guys who got back to Britain. They would be debriefed. And, you know, an awful lot of them would say, like, you know, I was helped by an Irish nun. I was helped by an Irish priest. That was a very common thread in their in their kind of like their conversations, their post evacuation conversations. I get the feeling, the sense with the rest of them, they have a loyalty to the country that they've, they've adopted and has adopted them. I think there's an element of that. I think for the guys who've already served in World War One, here the Germans are again. We're going to go again. But I think also this, there might be an Irish rebellious spirit here, not liking this this animal that was the Nazi regime coming into the place they're living, pushing them and their friends around and they rebel against that. I think there's a sense, perhaps in all of them, regardless of the other emotions, I think there's a sense of that rebellious spirit. We've got a big authoritarian, brutal regime that rings bells with Irish people and they push back against that. Now, I think you can guess from the last two episodes that I've really found these conversations with David fascinating and I couldn't finish without asking him how he uncovered these stories. The backstory in this, I was in Paris between 2006, 2008, working in the military archives on a totally different project than right now, totally different project. And I went up to, there's this particular office that deals with resistance. They were working on their database, updating their database. And I asked the idiot question. They have so many tasks. I asked the idiot question. I said, have you any Irish in the database? And apparently I was the first person asked this. So they put Ireland into place of origin, Ireland, bang. And that immediately brought back, I think, about, say, 15. Okay. And then I went into the actual cards and I found that some people had been, like, say, born in Cork. But then that was recorded as Great Britain. There was one particular guy who like, was very obviously Irish. Somebody had mis- misread the file and it had been, not Ireland, it had been put down as Holland. OK, so I was picking away at this and then all of a sudden I have 20, 25 plus. And actually, since publishing that wee article, more people have come forward to me. And there's a, a guy called John Morgan, who's very keen into kind of like Irish involvement in the resistance and escape lines. He's given me more. So we have about 50 now. It's obviously tricky to find stories of Irish people who served. As David outlined there, uncovering these stories is very difficult. If you have a relative who was involved in the French resistance, David would love to hear from you. Anybody, any information I thought I'd be so glad to hear it. I'm, I'm building the list up as I go. I'm based in the history department in Maynooth University. So I'm based in Maynooth and County Kildare. Anybody want to drop me an email? It's david.morphy at mu.ie. But by all means, drop me an email and I'd love to hear if you have, if you have somebody to add to the list or if you have some information to people on the list, I'd love to hear it. I have that email in the show notes below. Finally, to end the interview, I asked David where you can read more about his research. I published an article on this in a, in a book called Franco-Warish Military Connections. It was brought out with Four Courts Press. 
Uh, that must be nearly 20 years ago now. I don't know if that book is still in print, but you'll get it through your local library. You don't even have to buy the book. Franco-Irish Military Connections, okay? It's a four quarts press book. I did a couple of articles as well, but they're in French. Okay, so there's a couple of shorter articles. And there was some newspaper coverage at the time. They did the memorial. There's but very little literature on this. What I would say to people as well, if they have names, if they get names off the list of the family names, do a bit of Google research. It's amazing the stuff that actually comes up. I'd like to thank David for his time over the last two episodes. As I mentioned, there won't be a show out next week. I'll be editing that series on the history of podcasting. But that exclusive series on the Civil War is available on Patreon now. You can get it at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Until next time, Sloan. <laughs>